Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much. Welcome to our home. Appreciate you attending. Um, the class, again, we had mentioned last week that at the end of the class there are some on Zoom if they want to ask any questions. Uh, after the first part of my thoughts, I'll be more than happy to uh, address anything that's asked. Uh, if not, we'll continue with the second part as we always do. Again, uh, thank you very much for attending. The topic this week on my thoughts um, is something that uh, we use all the time, something called Havdalah. There is a ceremony that we as Orthodox Jews perform every week at the end of the Shabbat. Uh, it's called Havdalah, uh, meaning separation. I was amazed to find on Wikipedia, <laughs> of all things, a great description of the Jewish ritual. So it states there, Havdalah, in Hebrew, the word means separation. It is a Jewish religious ceremony that marks the symbolic end to the Shabbat and ushers in the new week. The ritual involves lighting a special Havdalah candle. It's braided with several wicks, blessing on a cup of wine. Again, wine is the preferred beverage and smelling sweet spices. The Shabbat ends on Saturday night after the appearance of three medium stars in the sky. Abdullah may be performed as late as sunset of the Tuesday following the Shabbat. And it's interesting because I found this a very concise and precise explanation of this ritual. It surprised me. Now, in the blessing that we recite in the Abdullah service, we thank God and acknowledge that it is he who, as the blessing reads, makes a distinction between the sacred and the profane, between the light and darkness, between Israel and the nations, and between the seventh day and the six days of work. Now, the way that we appreciate the value of something is by contrasting it to something else, much like a heart monitor. As long as there are peaks and then valleys, we are alive. If there are no peaks and no valleys, we flatline. Then everything is the same. Uh, then we are basically dead. Abdullah is intended to require a person to use all five of their senses in the performance of this ritual. First, we feel the cup, the sense of touch. We smell the spices, the sense of smell. We see the flame of the candle, the sense of sight. We hear the blessings, the sense of hearing. And then the t we taste the wine, again, the sense of taste. Havdol is one of the most ancient of all the blessings. And according to the Talmud, Ayan Knesset Havdol, the men of the Great Assembly, instituted blessings and prayers sanctifications, and havdolot for the Jewish nation. Now, again, this is based on the bracha, the Gemara Talmud in Brachos 33a. Some authorities hold that the obligation to recite havdolot, the havdolot prayer, is derived from the Torah itself, and other opinions state that it is a rabbinic ordination. Now, in the middle of the medieval period, the custom began of reciting havdolot over a cup of wine in the synagogue as well, not just at home. This was done in order to exempt those who had no wine in their home. Also for those strangers who uh, would spend their Shabbat in quarters that would adjoin the synagogue. Uh, this is one of the reasons that Kiddush was recited uh, Friday night in synagogues for those who would spend Shabbat there. There are synagogues even today that make Kiddush Friday night in the synagogue as a remembrance of this custom. Now, the primary symbols of Abdallah's service are the braided candle, the Kiddush cup containing wine, and the spice box containing sweet-smelling spices. The lighted candle symbolizes the light of the Shabbat and the strands of the braid that have been interpreted as the many types of Jews in the world, all of whom are part of one unified people. The wine is always, is always considered to be a symbol of joy, as it states in Psalm 104, Verse 15, wine gladdens the heart of man. We take one last sip of the joy of Shabbat as we bid the Shabbat farewell for another week. Similarly, the sweet-smelling spices symbolize the sweetness of the Shabbat, whose pleasant aroma we breathe in for one last time. We do this in the hope that it might carry us through the upcoming week until we can once again welcome the next Shabbat. This is a special blessing that praises God for making distinctions and separations, especially between the holy and the mundane. 
There are many customs that are connected with the Abdallah service that people observe. There are some people who overflow the wine when they pour it into the cup. This is done as a symbol that our blessings for the coming week should be overflowing. Others pour some of the wine on the ground as an omen of blessings. Others extinguish the flame by pouring wine from the cup after they fulfill their obligation. Now, after the flame is extinguished, many people have the custom to dip their fingers into this wine. They will then place the wine on the side of their eyes, their ears, and their mouth. This is done as a symbolic gesture requesting protection from heaven for what they see, hear, and speak throughout the coming week. You know, as a thought, I wondered if the saying, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, comes from this custom. Afterwards, they'll place their hands in their pockets as a symbolic request for prosperity. Well, what can a little money hurt? They tell a story about a man who visited his friend, and he was surprised to see a horseshoe hanging above the friend's front door. He says to his friend, do you really believe in that? Whereas his friend replied, well, of course not, but it works. <laughs> when saying the blessing over the light, some look at their fingernails and others look at their palms. This is done since it would be improper to recite a blessing for something and then not use the thing. It is also an illusion that a blessing should be continuous, much like our nails. They constantly grow, even after death. There's a measure that states that initially, when God created Adam, first man, that his whole body was covered with this nail-like substance. It was a protective shield for his flesh. However, when he sinned with the tree of knowledge, this protective covering was removed, which then created a need for clothing. Many have a custom to end Abdullah's ceremony by singing the song, Eliyahu Hanavi. We have a belief that it will be Elijah, Eliyahu the prophet, who will be the one to herald in the coming of Mashiach. May he come quickly in our time. There is a tradition that Mashiach will not come on the Shabbat. So with the Abdullah service, we say goodbye to the Shabbat, and now we can hope and pray that this week will be the time of his arrival, a time and the whole world will enter into a period of one long Shabbat. There is also a custom to cover one's thumb with the remaining four fingers before making the blessing over the flame. Then when making the blessing, one looks only at the four fingers that are covering their thumb. There is a measure that states that Adam, first man, was created without a thumb. It was not until the birth of Noah that man was blessed with a thumb. It is a thumb more than any other finger that allows a person to perform many varied and important tasks in life. There is an allusion to this in the verse in Genesis 5.29, where it states, And he called his name Noach, saying, That this shall comfort us in our work and in the toil of our hands. We can only imagine how much easier it was for man to perform his daily tasks, especially to work his field, with the benefit of a thumb. Now, the Abdullah service is also connected to Adam, first man in his sin of eating from the tree of knowledge. According to Kabbalah, the tree of knowledge was a grape. Based on this opinion, as an atonement for his sin, we use wine as a sacrificial beverage. Wine is the only beverage that has its own special beginning and ending blessing. You know, in the times of the temple, a wine libation would accompany all sacrifices that were brought up on the altar. Today, it is preferred beverage for all of our religious ceremonies, such as Kiddush, Abdallah, circumcisions, weddings, etc. Wine is one of the few things in creation that is not ravaged by the passing of time. In fact, a fine wine will only improve with the passage of time. You know, there are wines that date back to the 1700s and even earlier. A bottle of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, a French wine sold at auction at Christie's of London in 1985, sold for a record $156,450. This is the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold on record. It was rumored that this bottle was owned by Thomas Jefferson himself. It's interesting that Abdullah is the only ceremony that we observe that connects with the sense of smell. What does the sense of smell have to do with spirituality? When we read about Odin's sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, we read and we see there that he used four of his five senses when he ate from its fruit. 
The only sense that he did not profane with his transgression was the sense of smell. As I've mentioned before in my lectures, the Zohar states that holiness enters our body through our nose. As the verse in creation states, V'yipach ba'apov nishmas chayim. And God blew into his nostrils the breath of life. So God placed within the body of Adam, first man, his breath, a godly soul, a piece of himself, so to speak, a spiritual battery, which placed a spiritual component into the lifeless physical body of man. We have a tradition that on the Shabbat we receive what's called a neshama yisera, an extra soul that stays with us for all of the Shabbat. There's, this is one of the reasons that we eat so much on the Shabbat. Our sages tell us that, this, that somehow this soul is connected to the food that we eat, and it is insatiable. This may be one of the reasons that we are hungrier and eat so much on this very special day. There are many stories that are told in the Talmud and elsewhere <clears throat> excuse me, of the relationship between Rabbi Hurahan Nasi, also known as Rebbe, and Antoninus Pius, the Emperor of Rome. Antoninus would join Rebbe on occasion for his Shabbat afternoon meal. It once happened that Antoninus and Rebbe were sharing a meal during the week. Antoninus commented to Rabbi, Rebbe that somehow the hot food that they were eating that day really wasn't as tasty as the cold meal the Rebbe had served him on the Shabbat. Rebbe replied that there was an ingredient that was missing. Well, Antoninus asked Rebbe what the ingredient was and that he would send a servant immediately to the royal kitchen and bring him whatever he needed. Rebbe smiled and said to Antoninus, the ingredient that was missing in their weekday meal was the Shabbat. According to the Talmud, when the day of Shabbat ends, this extra soul also departs. This concept of an extra soul is hinted at in the verse in the Torah in Exodus 31.17, which speaks of the Shabbat. We recite this verse in our Shabbat morning Amida, standing prayer. It states that on the seventh day he, God, rested and was refreshed. The Hebrew word, uh, and he rested, can be broken up into two Hebrew words, vi nefesh, woe that the additional soul is gone. So we smell the spices as a form of smelling salts to revive our soul of its great loss. Another reason is given by the Bach a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Laws. We have a belief that the fires of purgatory are extinguished on the Shabbat, which gives those souls that are sequestered there a rest. However, once the Shabbat concludes, those fires are once again ignited, and our souls can sometimes feel some form of depression when they perceive a whiff of the stench emanating from purgatory. I've heard that one should not try to be in a hurry to make Havdalah on the Saturday night, since the angels do not reignite the fires of purgatory until one makes their Havdalah. After I heard the statement, I, I wondered how was it possible that the angels would wait until after Havdalah before they would reignite the fires? After all, not everyone makes Havdalah at the same time. In addition, we know there are different time zones. So I had a question, but I wasn't able to find an answer. So I put the question aside and waited and hoped that someday uh, I would find out the answer. Sure enough, there was some time much later, I went to a small shul at someone's house for the evening prayer at the end of the Shabbat. You know, I arrived just as the rabbi was talking and he asked my question. When the sages tell us that they wait to reignite the fires of purgatory until Abdullah is made, who is this referring to? I was amazed <laughs> and very interested. So I listened carefully to what his answer would be. He explained that the sages tell us that if after a lifetime here on earth, a person finds himself in purgatory, the angels will look to see how he ended his Shabbat before they reignite his fires. If he was prompt and ended his Shabbat right on time, well, guess what? Then they too will do the same and light his fire promptly. If, however, he was not in a rush to end the Shabbat, and he waited before he would make Abdullah, then they too will not be prompt when they relight his fires. It put a big smile on my face when I heard his answer. It made sense, and at the same time it answered a question that had bothered me for a long time. There is yet another reason given by the Bartanura, based on the mission in the Tractate of Tinus 4.3. He states there, Sunday, 
It was the third date after man's creation. Since Adam was created on Friday, just on Friday again, just as the third day after circumcision is considered to be the most dangerous and painful for the person, so too Sunday is considered to be a time of weakness on a spiritual level for the soul. So to resuscitate and strengthen the soul, we smell fragrant spices. So we use the wine sacrificially to atone for Adam's sin, and we smell spices to resuscitate the soul from the loss of the neshama yaseira, the additional soul that enters our bodies on the Shabbat. But why do we make a blessing on fire in our Havdalah service? What is the connection to Havdalah? When we look at the description of creation of the world, we see that after each and every day the Torah writes, Vahi era vahi boker, and it was evening and it was morning. However, there is no mention of there being an evening and morning on the seventh day. The question is, why not? So the sages tell us that Adam, first man, was created on the ninth hour of the sixth day, and that on the night of the seventh day, the Shabbat, the sun did not set. So the first time that Adam, first man, saw darkness was on Saturday night. One can only imagine Adam's surprise and concern. He thought that the darkness was due to his sin and that it was part of his punishment from eating from the fruit of the tree. God assured him that night and day were natural events that were already built into the creation of the world. He was told that this phenomenon would repeat itself each and every day. God then showed Adam how to rub two stones together to create fire. So, the commemorate, so to commemorate the, this fact, we say a special blessing on fire on Saturday night in our Havdalah prayer. The psalm also answers another question. Why is it that the only prohibitive act mentioned in the Torah out of all the 39 creative acts that we are prohibited from performing on the Shabbat is fire? All the other 38 prohibitions are derived from those actions performed by the Israelites during the building of the tabernacle in the desert. Though they work with an alacrity, God did not allow them to perform any creative acts on the Shabbat. The Shabbat took precedence over the building of the house of God. And according to the sages, when the Torah uses a singular form of the word mitzvah, it is referring to the Shabbat, the one mitzvah, that is equal to all the other commandments of the Torah. The commentaries ask, why was the prohibition of making fire stated in the book of Exodus, in the portion of Vayakel, whereas all the other prohibitive acts were only alluded to in the construction of the tabernacle? And they answer that we mention in the Friday night of Mita that we keep the Shabbat, Zecher Lamase Bereshus, in commemoration of the six days of creation. Now, since fire wasn't introduced to Adam until Saturday night, there could have been a thought to say that fire should not be included together as one of the created acts that God performed during the six days of creation. So that being the case, making a fire on the Shabbat would therefore be permitted. So to dispel such a thought, fire is the only prohibitive act that is specifically mentioned in the Torah. After the Habdalah service is concluded, there are various customs that people follow. Some recite the blessing, Vayitain Lecha, May God give you, which connects to the blessing that Yaakov, our father, gave to his two grandsons, Ephraim and Menashe, before his death. There are others who recite a prayer authored by Rablevi Yitzchak of Bardichev, called Gut Mi Himmel, prayer of Sunny Yiddish, which means God in heaven protect your flock, Israel. There is a custom among Svartim to say the prayer Pita Makatoras, a prayer that describes all of the ingredients that were included to make up the incense that was offered up daily in the temple. All of these customs have one thing in common. They are all connected to a hope and a prayer for protection and blessings for the upcoming week. So hopefully, we now have a better understanding of the ritual of Havdalah and the symbolized symbolism that the wine, candle, and spices play out in our performance of this mitzvah. Let us hope and pray that the time will come shortly where we no longer have to make a separation between the holy and the mundane, since with the coming of Mashiach Sikeno, with the Messiah, the world will then be able to enter into a holy time of a continuous Shabbat.
And again, that finishes the lecture on my thought for Havdalah. Um, if there are no questions, then we will move on. And again, if there are, we will answer them. So since seeing nobody seems to be asking. Uh, we will um, first thank you for attending, for uh, listening to this lecture. And again, God should bless you and yours, health and with wealth and with uh, goodness of all, uh, without measure. And uh, God should bless you with a good week and Shabbat Shalom. Again, thank you very much for attending.